Hey guys, if you're shopping for knives and gear, make sure you check out the description of the video you're watching right now for a link to my Amazon store, where I've compiled some of the very best items available, including some of my own personal recommendations. Thanks! What's going on YouTube? Middle Complex here, and today I've got another interesting knife review slash knife overview to share with you guys. This is the Kubi Drake in carbon fiber. I will point out that this does also come in G10, and I will be providing links down in the description where you can pick this up. This knife was uh, provided by the Apex Pass Around Group, so thank you. Shout out to all my friends in the Apex Pass Around Group. And uh, that means by extension, the manufacturer Kubi. So I appreciate that. Just full disclosure, that's where it came from. Um, so uh, and before we get started here, of course, thank you so much to my generous patrons for supporting me. If you'd like to check out my Patreon, there is, of course, a link down in the description. Your support would mean the world to me. So right off the bat, let me uh, point this out. Um, this knife is manufactured in China. Like I said, this comes with carbon fiber. And what's the blade steel? The blade steel on this guy is Aus 10. What is Aus 10? There's two things that are going to dismiss or that people are going to dismiss about Aus 10 immediately. Number one, it starts out with Aus and everybody thinks of Aus 8, right? And everybody uh, associates Aus 8 with the lower end of the knife. Well, um, there are definitely worse steels than Aus 8, just to first point that out. I've, I uh, regularly use Aus 8 in my cold steel um, tough light. And yeah, it doesn't hold an edge very long, but man, it's easy to sharpen up and it's a great budget steel. You know, you can use it. It's, it's pretty tough stainless, etc. right? Aus 10 is an upgrade of Aus 8. Now, if you look it up on Z knives, the first, th first thing you're going to see, the thing that's going to jump out of you, uh, jump out at you is that it says it's a variation of uh, AISI, I hope I'm seeing that correctly or remembering that correctly, uh, 440C, essentially, it's a variation of that. Um, but it's it's got a little bit of a different composition. Essentially, what we're looking at here is a is Aus 8 with um, uh, an upgrade to carbon content, um, and then an upgrade to, I think, vanadium. Now, I was not super familiar with Aus 8. Normally, I don't start my reviews out like this, but uh, when I am, you know, in question of these things, there are a few people that I lean on. Uh, super Steel Steve, oftentimes. Um, I like checking out Love Them Knives. Uh, and then, of course, Cedric and Ada. If you guys are not subscribed to Cedric and Ada, um, you should be because they do the cut tests and they show a lot of information you know, associated with certain steels. Now, obviously, different uh, companies heat treat things differently. A lot of this depends on uh, geometry and heat treat, of course. But watching Cedric and Ada do the uh, cut test with a, I think it was a Cold Steel Voyager in Aus 10, totally different edge geometry and perhaps the heat treat is different. But just to give you an idea, a reference point of what Aus 10 is capable of, it ended up doing, after they put a work sharp edge on it, right? Uh, it ended up doing, I was like 140 cuts on rope, which was a similar, in fact, a little bit better than his tests with D2 and 154 CM. So before you dismiss us 10, understand that it's, a, that's a pretty, that's pretty impressive considering this is an ingot form steel. Now, again, it may not be totally relative to this because I don't know how it's heat treated, the geometry, while well, it's pretty darn good, right? I mean, a lot of that has to do with it. So that is the potential, I guess, so to speak. It's a reference point for Aus 10. This seems to be to be a, a pretty capable composition. Anyways, let's go ahead and get a measurement on this guy. So overall, like this is not a small knife. It's only the second Kubi I've ever reviewed. 8.75 inches overall. Blade length coming in at 3.9. And cutting edge coming in at just a hair over. It's but almost exactly 3.5. How about some size comparisons? Up against the Ontario Rat Model 1. Rat 1 is coming in at 8.6 inches overall. So the Rat is a little bit shorter than a Kubi Drake. Uh, how about up against the Spyderco PM2? Spyderco PM2 coming in at 8.3 inches overall. I'm going to just get the butts together. There we go. Uh, how about up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue? Ritter Hogue coming in at 8 inches overall. And last but not least, the Spyderco Para 3. Spyderco Para 3 is coming in at seven and a quarter inches overall. How's the action on this guy? It's running on bearings, and it is pretty typical of what I feel in um, the sub $100 knife world. Uh, it's got nice smooth action. Um, it's not completely false shut, but it does just, you know, a little bit of encouragement. The D10 is tuned properly. It's very easy to flip. It's got a pretty small flipper tab. You can engage that with your finger, that little hole. Truthfully, though, it's kind of the same issue that I had with the Tucson TS-64. You really have to kind of dig your finger underneath there. And it means you there's a fair bit of adjustment before you actually go to deploy it. It's not like the Spyderco PM2, 
where you can pretty much actively engage it immediately. You kind of have to dig at it. Uh, I really would have liked to see a combination of a couple of different things here. Number one, more of an area here that makes this area more accessible to your finger and possibly more of a ramp here, more of a curvature to make more room. I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to keep it down here. But look, I mean, we've got so much height here. I mean, what's a little bit more here, right? So a little bit higher, a little more of a hole, a little more of an area right here to engage, perhaps right here too. You can see the scallop is kind of meant for that area, but it's not right in line with it. I mean, a couple of little changes would have made that a lot more accessible. It's not the end of the world because again, the primary means of deployment is the flipper tab. And because this is a hole and not a stud or something else, it means there's nothing in the cutting path. So worst case scenario, it's a slight gunk trap for the stuff that you're cutting. You just clean it off at the end of the day. And that's that. Um, not really that big of a deal. Uh, let's see here. Why don't we go ahead and do the hardware check? Get out my handy dandy WTF. My handy dandy. <laughs> I promise it's a good product. My handy dandy WIA bit selector and WIA magnetic driver. Two items that are extremely inexpensive. And despite that, I mean, it's meant to do that, guys. <laughs> Very recommendable. You can find them down in the Amazon store at the beginning of my uh, that I reference at the beginning of all my videos. Just pull up in the store and choose knife maintenance. I'm going to guess that pivot is T8. Yeah, it's very common in the knife world. Oh, do we have T8 hardware on the body as well? We do. We absolutely do. T8 across the board. That is wonderful. I love to see that. It is exactly the setup that I like to see because anything smaller than T6, I get worried about the uh, bit heads, even if they're WIAs, the bit head stripping or the fasteners themselves stripping. Um, I also like it when it's all the same size, so you can just put a bit in and take it all apart and you don't have to switch the bits. It's easy, it's nice and convenient, so that's a huge plus in my book. Let's go ahead and do size uh, or carry profile. So thickness up against the Spyderco Para 3. You can see here that this guy's pretty thick. Um, we have nicely contoured, very, uh, you know, pretty thick, but nicely contoured um, carbon fiber scales. So while there is some excess thickness here, and this isn't gonna create for the best experience in the pocket for some people, uh, the benefit to the excess thickness and contouring is that it really nicely fills out the hand. There, I mean, the feeling of absolute security with this thing in the hand, you know, the combination of there being a lot of handle room, a lot of freedom, you're not really forced into one specific area on this nice on this knife. It really is very comfortable. So, yeah, excess thickness, definitely there, right? So if you wear skinny jeans, uh, if you wear athletic shorts, if you wear, you know, leather pants, whatever, um, it's uh, it's not going to be super duper comfortable for you. But anybody who carries a full size knife and wears jeans or work pants on a day to day basis, it's not really going to bother you. But it is definitely wider or thicker than a PM2 or Para 3, which aren't all that thin to begin with. Uh, up against the um, carry profile of these two knives, which have unquestionably awkward carry profiles, and nobody ever seems to complain about a whole lot. You can see there that we're definitely longer than the Para 3. We are actually a little bit longer, I think. Maybe exactly. Yeah, in my light here, I think that it's about the exact same length as the PM2. At maximum height, which is actually down here, or flipper tab, it's it's still not as tall as the PM2, but it it is close in some places. Um, still, though, I mean, what I'm saying here is that the biggest you know factor here in your pocket is going to be the thickness of the scales. But at least they've added contouring. If they were big blocks and they weren't contoured, that would really suck. But the contouring really adds to the, the quality of the ergonomic feel. In terms of weight, so we're looking at um, the calipers. There we go. Uh, blade stock thickness. Let me, so, sorry, I'm, I got to switch hands here. Make sure we're zeroed out and that we are all the way closed. Blade stock thickness of, uh, it says 116 thousandths. It's probably that or 115,000. So not a very thick blade stock up against the uh, Benchmade Griptilian or Ritter Rogue. You can see there it is slightly thinner. This guy being about 125,000. So I'm going to guess that is definitely accurate. And then on the inside of this knife, you can see the steel liners do have a little bit of milling on one side, which is nice. A lot of the excess weight, I mean, I, I, maybe it's just a combination of the steel liners and some of the excess thickness in the carbon fiber, but it still doesn't come in at an insane weight. 4.76 ounces. It's substantially longer than the Benchmade Griptilian or Ritter Hogue, and this guy comes in at very, very close to the same weight. So you're definitely getting, I mean, in this case, you're actually, you're getting a bigger blade, but you're getting a little tiny bit more cutting edge, um, and you're getting the addition of the forward choil, right, for 0.2 ounces more. So no, I don't have a problem with that weight. If you're used to carrying a pair of three for a bug out or mini bug out, 
yeah. Or if you like smaller knives, this isn't going to be your thing. But as, for those of us who like to carry larger knives, um, is this, uh, you know, excessive or going to be overly cumbersome in the pocket? Not really. The excess thickness might bother you a little bit, but for the most part in jeans or regular pants, it's really not going to be that big of a deal. All right. Did we get through everything? Yeah, I think we did. So let's take a look at the anatomy of this knife. I really like that pivot. I like it when they keep the billboarding off the blade. There's a little bit here. You can see the designer and then it says Aus 10. Here's what I do like about this though. Um, what on earth does that say? I can't read that completely, but what I do like here is that any billboarding is so minimal and they put the logo on the pivot. That's a move that I really have come to enjoy with a lot of makers. Um, I don't like to see China on the blade. I know this is made in China. I'm aware of that. Most people who buy it are going to be aware of it as well. Um, if you didn't know, it's made in China. Uh, but uh, it's like, I don't need the, a big paragraph of all the model information, the serial number, all that stuff. And I don't need the makers. I mean, the makers logo doesn't really bother me. I can understand when they put the maker logo, when they put the designer logo, and they, when they put the blade seal. That's the most I ever want to see on the blade. Um, they actually went a step further and just put the uh, logo on the pivot, which I think looks really nice. The pivot really does look good. Really beautiful. You can see on the carbon fiber, we've got a little bit of milling lines here, and that's really nice to look at. Carbon fiber is super high quality, and it is carbon fiber all the way through. Very, very beautiful. The hardware looks nice. The backspacer is titanium anodized along with the uh, pocket clip, and that looks really beautiful. The fit and finish on this is all great. All the way around, no sharp edges. A little bit of a poke right there, but not that big of a deal. It's certainly not something that's going to bother you while you're interacting with it. The flipper tab has a little bit of jimping on it, but it is nicely knocked down. So this is easy to engage this way. And it's not something that's going to bother you, you know, that much during use. If you're really going to bear down on this knife and use it for a long period of time, then you want to wear gloves. So use your best judgment there. This does have a forward choil. It's not much of a choil. You can kind of get that first knuckle in there. And, you know, considering where they've got the jimping right here, I guess this makes sense. I always like to hold knives like this, especially when I'm bearing down on thick cardboard. Not that big. I mean, I always say, like, if you're going to do a choil, do a full one. There are knives that have had just that much of choil that I haven't complained about as much, but this is my honest thought all the way through. It's never a deal breaker if you can only get one knuckle in there. It just makes it to where you have to pay more attention to where your finger is so you don't cut yourself. But I always prefer either the whole thing or nothing. And that's going to be different for every person because everybody's fingers are going to be different thicknesses. So your finger might fit in there a little bit better than mine. Some people are going to go, no, my finger won't fit in there at all, right? Um, a good reference point for an excellent uh, choil is the um, uh, the Bestec Shodan. Oh my goodness, fantastic. Because there's a space that keeps your finger from riding up on the blade. There's a little tiny little chunk of steel that keeps your, you know, you subconsciously it keeps you from running up on the blade. This isn't bad. This is fine. It's just my thoughts on it. Uh, the blade finish here looks to be, I mean, it kind of, honestly, it looks kind of bead blasted. It's not quite reflective enough to be what I'd call vapor blasted, but it is nice. If it is bead blasted, um, even stainless steels are, uh, you know, that are bead blasted are a little more prone to corrosion than a finish, uh, than, than uh, stainless steels with a finish like tumbled or uh, satin finished or, you know, of course, high belt satin finish or mirror polish, right? But it shouldn't be that big of a deal. In this case, I think it's really nice. The contrast between um, this blasted uh, blade and the polished hardware and, of course, the blue titanium. This is just a really nice look. In fact, I really, really like how this knife looks. I, I don't have a problem with it at all. It's kind of a reverse recurve, or I'm sorry, reverse tanto blade shape, but it also kind of looks sheep's footy. I don't know. The, the, what it yields here, more importantly than the classification of the blade, is that you still have a, a tip that is capable of puncture tasks, and you have an enormous amount of cutting belly, and it does get nice and thin behind the edge. It's not insanely thin, but it does get thin enough that it's really going to be a good slicer. It's going to be a good performance blade. You're going to be able to do a lot of you know slicing tasks, things like that, so that's great. Up here, everything's nicely knocked down. No sharp edges, anything like that. I like how they've got the flat, how they've got the wedge. It's just a handsome blade. I like this curvature here too. If I do want to rest my thumb up here, I can. Um, but the standard position, you know, the where you're going to put your thumb and, you know, in terms of the jimping, it's just fine. Really, really nice. The edge is done very, very well. It is absolutely sharpened correctly. Um, I think the geometry is fine for EDC or even some, you know, more heavy duty cutting tasks. The flat runs out... I guess about 80% the length of the blade. And uh, it comes down to a, a fairly sharp tip, but because of the shape here, or a fairly pointy tip, because of the shape, there is a quite a bit of excess material down here behind the tip versus like the tip on the PM2, right? So even though this is a thicker blade stock, you've got much less material down here behind the tip. So it's still gonna be fairly robust and you don't have to worry about it as much. I believe OS 10 is fairly tough, so you should be okay there. Um, Moving back down to the scales, like I said, carbon fiber looks great. 
like the scallop here, I just wish it was, I wish it was a deeper cutout here for easier engagement on this. It's impossible to flick this out this way. You can just barely get that. But again, the excess, I mean, it's not a, it's not a pleasurable experience, right? It doesn't feel like an organic experience. I, I have to work at it. I don't want to have to work at it. I want it to be organic, like the flipper tab. Flipper tab, I know exactly what to do with it. It's easy, it's convenient, it's quick. That's your main means of deployment. Really wish there was more of a cutout down here. I wish this area was a little bit bigger, especially considering the tallest point of the blade is right here, right? So it wouldn't make any difference, in my opinion, to add a little bit more height, but it's not really that big of a deal. Uh, moving on here, you can see we do have the steel liners. They could have countersunk these. I oftentimes like to see the liners so I can see all the contrast and the different, you know, it, it, I guess it would have reduced the weight a little bit more, but again, the weight is not heavy enough on a blade like this where it really bothers me. You're looking at four inches of blade and four and a half ounces of weight. So the ratios are really not anything to complain about, um, but it, it looks nice. And I imagine that process keeps the cost down. You know, and a, counters, uh, a countersunk liner, um, it probably costs a little bit more to do um, than just liners on the outside. It's probably not very much, but it probably saves a little bit of money. Uh, the backspacer is nice and flush. It's a sort of polished, I don't know. It's a pol yeah, it's like a polished uh, titanium backspacer. We have this polished titanium uh, pocket clip. I mean, I mean I'm 99% sure that that is titanium, but I'll go ahead and check. Yeah. And then the, the liners are steel. Uh, let's see here. What was I getting at? Oh yeah, the pocket clip. I think the screw, the nice thing is, is the screw that's holding the pocket clip is hidden on the underneath. So you get to enjoy the aesthetic of the pocket clip and not the screw hanging out. That's a minor thing, but it's kind of nice. It's not a completely deep carry clip, but there's so little of the um, pocket clip sticking out of your pocket or the, uh, the butt of the knife that it, it doesn't bother me at all. The lanyard hole is there and it is not prioritized above the pocket clip, which is, in my opinion, the right way to do that. Um, this is a, something I haven't been pointing out here lately on Fully Knife Reviews. This is a right-handed only knife. You can't uh, change the pocket clip to the other side. So sorry, lefties, but you know, it's, it seems like lefties always kind of get screwed in the uh, folding knife world. Um, I wish that there was a spot on the other side, but you know, when they do that, they mill out of pocket. I don't really care, but a lot of people, you know, I find that a lot of people are, are bothered by the little milling spot on the other side. So I guess it is what it is. Um, there is, this is a steel liner lock. It engages at, it's looking like, I mean, it's curved a little bit. I'd say it's probably engaging at about 50, 55%. And the blade is absolutely perfectly centered. The lockup is 100% solid. No, no, uh, blade play up, down, left, or right. So that's great. This is definitely a quality piece. Little nitpicks again, being, I really wish that I could engage this hole. If I could engage that hole, I would have been a lot happier. By the way, there's no double clutch. This is an easy knife to um, engage and disengage. But see, right there, that's it's just going to cause a problem. I'm honest. I'm not trying to like emphasize my point. I'm honestly trying there, right? Easy to um, disengage the liner, engage the liner. It's easy to engage the flipper tab. All that's fine. If you don't like to do that type of fidgety stuff, it's not necessarily something that you should not buy the knife. I mean, just people who really like to do that reverse flick and make use of that hole are going to be bothered by that, right? but the knife is still fully functional without it. And if you don't care about that, you can basically ignore, ignore what I'm saying there. The knife is definitely big, so that's gonna bother some people. And the scales are definitely th on the thicker side, so that's gonna bother some people. But if you really like that fill out the hand feeling, I mean, I honestly, just holding this, I'm thinking, yeah, I really could use this knife for a long period of time in, in comfort, you know, even without gloves. So there definitely is a lot of good here. In fact, there's enough good that, you know, I'm pretty happy with it. So what's the price on this guy? On this one with the carbon carbon fiber scales, uh, I'm finding the price comes in at about like between eighty and ninety dollars, and I'm guessing the G10 version of it comes in a little bit less. This is a fairly competitive price point in the knife world, but it's not uncommon to see materials like this in this price point. So yeah, I I don't have a problem with this price point at all. This is a pretty impressive knife for the money, and like I said, if you don't need the carbon fiber, just go with the G10 one, and I'm sure you save a little bit of money. And I'm sure it also comes in a variety of different colors as well. I think this is a pretty good knife. It's got a couple of quarks. I mean, like I said, if if that little slot was more accessible, I would have just been overjoyed with this. I would have been so, you know, I, I, because I really like to manipulate my knives like that. I like to have the freedom to use that. And the benefit outside of fidget factor is if you're wearing gloves and it has a large thumb, thumb hole, when I'm using this knife and I'm wearing gloves, I love that thumb hole because it doesn't matter, you know, like like when I'm wearing gloves and I'm using a knife with a thumb stuck, sometimes the I, I get my finger in the wrong position, right? And it's just it can be a mess to deploy it. But if a thumb hole is done properly, you can engage it with gloves, you know, no matter what. 
This, I can barely do it with my bare hand, right? Probably be okay with a flipper tab, but considering the size of this knife and what I would use it for, I want all of those little things to be accessible, at least mildly accessible with gloves. So that would have made a huge difference for me, but the knife is still definitely worth the money. Uh, this knife is going to be going on my most recommended knives playlist. I did enjoy this knife. So yeah, check it out. There's going to be links down in the description. Guys, that's going to be pretty much it for today's knife review. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do don't like. So check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that metal complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.